It's always a uh, question for me how to optimally serve you on a day like this. Because the fact that you've committed to a day of something is placing a value because you have lots of things to do with your time. So very rarely is this coming out of boredom or lack of opportunities. It's coming out of uh, what motive? I mean, at the deepest level, maybe the motive to be free. The motive to get a handle on suffering, yours and others. The motive to uh, understand what's going on. What are you doing here? What function have you? Uh, the motive to feel more joy in moment-to-moment -moment life, to live fully. Uh, the uh, desire, the desire to live fully, the desire to be um, in some relationship of peace with death. To be able to handle change well, changing conditions. To uh, open your hearts, to be able to love more. Have I covered pretty much everybody? Is there anybody that wants to add one? Excuse me? Deal with anger. Yeah, well, I uh, had put the opposite end of that polarity, the deal with love, but uh, it's certainly, it's, it's how do you let go of the things that are kind of a drag. How to integrate all of this into day-to-day -day living reconcile it, bring it together. What? And its relationship to the political and environmental world. And what? And salvation and, oh, starvation and rape. I'm getting very specific now. I think those came under categories like suffering. But if you don't feel I covered them with suffering, I... Reconciliation and living with it, with suffering. Yeah, okay. Relax, it's all right. <laughs> I'm your friend, it's all right. <laughs> you don't know yet. You'll find out I am your friend. <laughs> Well, I, I think I'd like to, um, uh, in a way, cut to the chase. Um, and um, usually at, um, in the, I'm on a lecture tour now. Some of you have been to some of the lectures along the way. Um, and in the lectures, I sort of give a kind of metaphysical um, context in which we can see our lives from moment to moment, which is part of like your question. And um, but what I'm going to do today is um, assume it for the moment. And then as you are not comfortable with the results of it, you can ask me to go back and I'll, uh, by your questions, I'll know whether or not I should go back and pick up some of the metaphysical strings. And what I mean by cutting to the chase is,
if it is true that we accept that we have arrived at certain assumptions. Certain assumptions like that there is the possibility of an individual to awaken. That uh, there is a mystery in terms of death and suffering in the universe with which we are going to become comfortable or relate to. that our incarnation is not an error. That we, it's right that we are here, it's not only right that we're here, it's right that we're in the exact situation we're in here at this moment, each of us. These are all the conclusions of the metaphysics. Also, that the paradoxes must be embraced. It's all empty and it's all full. There is time and there is no time, etc. There is form and there is formless. Now, I can go on and on with the assumptions that arise out of the metaphysics of awakening. But let's assume all those things for the moment and then say, where do we as individuals, what, what are we to do? What should we do today? What should we do with our lives? How could we live our lives so that we have the optimum opportunity to hear the truth of the situation from moment to moment? How do we live our lives so that we are, we have accessible the full quality of the compassion, the inherent compassion in our hearts? How do we live our lives with sufficient perspective, moment to moment, so that we can we can enter into the moments of life with equanimity and peace. So there is truth or wisdom, there is compassion, love, There is equanimity and peace. And there is a passionate life, a life fully lived. Those are the four criteria. Those are where you're going. And out of all that comes joy when you're living that way truth, wisdom, in harmony with the universe around you, in the Tao, in the way of things. So your life feels from moment to moment, yeah, I'm in the right place at this moment. I mean, it's weird, but this is just what I should be doing just now. Now, how to realize those things is what yoga and spiritual practices are about. To simplify your predicament at the moment, you were born into an incarnation. You were surrounded by people who thought who they thought they were was real. And they took you into what's called somebody training. And you went to become somebody, to have a name, to have an identity, to have a social role, an expectation, and they weren't satisfied till you thought it was real. <laughs> it 
And the minute you thought it was real, then they started the next part of the training, which was to make you somebody special. See, just somebody isn't good enough. You've got to be somebody special. And the justification is the fear in you that to be nobody is to be a loser, and to be a loser is a threat to your survival, psychologically or physically. And most of the people you read about in People magazine have been eminently successful at both of those games, becoming somebody and then somebody special. So they have developed very evolved ego structures. They know exactly who they think they are. And they have, as a result of their strategies of mind, amassed worldly power, fame or money or something to show that they are somebody special. Then the next step that happens, and it doesn't happen to everybody, it apparently doesn't. Some people go all the way through to their death being somebody special and then freak when that person dies. But for a lot of people, or a few people, or an un unknown number of people, there is an awakening process in which you suddenly realize you've been had. That you not only aren't somebody exclusively, you aren't even somebody special exclusively. And the horror is balanced with the freedom of, oh my God, that is, I don't have to be that person anymore. Because any way you've defined yourself is already a prison. I mean, if you say, I'm a mother, great, but Ma, I'm 50 years old, it doesn't matter, I'm your mother. I mean, it's, you can feel the, the rigidity with which roles hold on. I'm a truck driver, but we're in bed, it doesn't matter, I'm a truck driver. We get imprisoned in our, in our egos, in our roles. What gets imprisoned? Awareness gets imprisoned. We think we think who we are. We have learned to think we are. We identify with this body, with a personality. We all have needs, desires, fears, hopes, yearnings, attachments, opinions, endless ones of those. And we think we're real. Well, are we real or aren't we? Well, it turns out we're relatively real. <laughs> we're as real as anything else, but no more so then. And there's a lot of else that you are also. That you're not being because you're busy being who you think you are. Too much of the time. So that's the predicament. That's why you do practices. To get out of the trap of your own finite self to be able to move into the planes of awareness where you recognize yourself again, anew, afresh, as part of the universe, as part of the, the dance, as us, as instead of them, so that the earth is us and the suffering people are us instead of them, the Bosnians aren't them, they're us. And how do you live with that kind of real Identity, not just an intellectual thought, we are us, but actually acting from the place of usness. The problem is it's frightening because you will lose something you are afraid in your identity as a separate entity. So that the whole issue of community identity or interdependency identity as opposed to separate ego identity is a major issue for many people. And the assumption of the work is that if you start from your separate entity, which feels vulnerable and frightened, and therefore you establish as much power around you as you can, your mind, that if you will liberate the energy from the exclusive identification with that, that is, if you will open through practices into these other identities, even though it will be frightening. Ultimately, you will be 
free in the sense that you're in all of the identities. You're not pushing away some and holding tightly onto some. And out of that freedom, you will hear the optimum response to make in any situation that embraces the we and the me. Because to become us and deny yourself is off balance, and to become only yourself and deny us is also off balance. And you and I are dealing partly with balance, with learning how to have a very rich and extended identity that includes me as a separate entity, me interdependent with all of you and everybody, so that it's us, and also if I'm going to truly plumb the depths of my awareness and my mystical possibilities, the I that is where all of it is only one thing, and it's all an internal job. There's only one. Is that concept there's only one just a concept, or are we only one? If we're only one, is it only one plus me? Oh, great one. The one include, must include you, or there's two. So there's also the plane of the oneness. And when you enter into that plane of oneness, there is neither one nor two. And then you experience the uh, emptiness inherent in form. Just like there is silence inherent in these words. And at this moment, you can take your awareness and focus on my words, or you can focus on the silence. It's a figure ground issue. So part of our process is methods that will help us escape from an inordinate preoccupation with ourselves as separate entities, that is, our ego structure, not so that we destroy it, but such that we are open to these other planes of consciousness, and then ultimately we integrate all these planes, and then we are both separate and non-separate. We are both the one and the many. I mean, then you start to understand the mystical statements like there's nowhere to stand, meaning no plane you can stand on. There we begin to understand a mystical statement, one does nothing and nothing is left undone. How about that one? One does nothing. Now think of doing dishes. One does nothing and nothing is left undone. Can you do the dishes and not do the dishes at the same moment? If you aren't, you're a spiritual slob. You're totally undisciplined. You're totally into the drama of identifying with your actions. You're busy doing the dishes. What are you doing? I'm doing the dishes. Can't you see that? I'm doing the dishes again. I'm always doing the dishes. I'm not going to do those damn dishes. Hear all the identity around dishes. How about the place behind it where it's nothing's happening? You're just sitting in your awareness, and dishes doing is happening. It's interesting. You drive a car probably. Most of you drive cars. And think about it. After you learned how to drive and you started to drive, you make these decisions about centrifugal and centripetal force rates of acceleration and deceleration. I mean, the most complicated decisions you're making, and you're not even thinking about it. And most of the people, if they're driving a car, you say, what's happening? They'd say, I'm listening to the radio, or I'm thinking about where I'm going, or I'm trying, I'm working out that relationship, or I'm watching for the police, or I'm, who knows what nefarious activity you're involved in in the car. <laughs> but you're not busy, I'm, we're playing. But not a great percentage of people are busy driving. I'm driving. You know, I can't think. I'm driving. See? 
See? Now there, there's a good example. There's a whole complex set of responses that went what they call on base brain. I mean, it went sort of on automatic till a crisis arises and then you bring it back into consciousness and you trust that process will happen. It would be interesting to have your ego in the same category as driving a car. Something you could call upon if you needed to be conscious of it, but you didn't have to spend all your time in it. It's just not a, an interesting enough place to spend all your time being separate from everything else in the universe. There is a basic alienation feeling in it, you might have noticed. So, our methods are to open us to these other planes of reality on which we simultaneously exist. First, get it so that we are balanced in these planes, so that we have access to them as readily as we have access to the one we started from. Start to attend to what it is in the plane we started from is so sticky, keeps catching us so much, and start to work with it like the issue of anger. and then act in the world in a way that honors the truth of all of these planes of consciousness at once. Okay, I think we're ready for practice now. The practices we want to do, basically, are we want to develop strategies for, for getting into connection to the mechanics of our mind, not just the content of our mind. Ever since you were born, you've been filling your mind with thoughts, information. If I ask you how much is two and two, most all of you will say four. That's a condition, a thing, that's a thought form that you've developed. So you've been filling your head with what you'd call knowledge. The predicament with the stuff in your head is that you'll notice how absolutely demanding and seductive it is. It's very hard not to think it. You watch how much at the mercy of your thoughts you are all day long. You wake up, I mean, you're just waking up, I got to go to the toilet, thought. So you're suddenly somebody that needs to go to the toilet. Then you smell coffee or something. Ah, the aroma of coffee. That thought grabs you and you are aroma smelling of coffee. Then comes, what was I dreaming about? then the mind is reaching back to grab these sort of elusive images that are dissolving as you wake up. Then I got to do my laundry today. Then this whole laundriness is your consciousness. And then I could sleep for 10 more minutes. And there's that whole yearning. And then it's warm in that corner of the bed. And on and on. And the mind starts like a trip hammer. These are all happening at about a, a, a tenth of a thousandth of a second each. And they're just going brrrr. And you start, and all day long your mind goes brrrr. Think me, think me, think me. I'm real. Think me, think me, think me. And your mind is pee, warm, laundry, call, da, da, da. Stand upright, da, da, da. Close, uh, hair, ah, uh, face, ah, uh, e, on, on. Eat, eat, enough, I'll stop, eat, walk, uh, uh, left foot, right foot, walk, bus, ooh, ah, uh, e, uh, e, uh. And you can feel the whole day is just this, brrr, and then at the end of the day, you fall exhausted in a bed, hope to go into deep sleep where you can break this thing, 
And then in the morning, you start all over again. Now, is it possible that that stuff could keep coming up just as it does? It's like rivers flowing. You're not going to stop it. But that where you are inside in relation to it could not be at its mercy. Now, I'm trying to think of metaphors that would really work. Imagine a, you have a flashlight or a torch, as they're called in other parts of the world, a flashlight. And you turn on the flashlight and you flash it, on, it's dark, on this and that. Now, think of the flashlight as the awareness. And the thises and thats are all the thoughts, feelings, sensations, all of that stuff that's coming like this. Brrr. The awareness is the flashlight. Is it possible that the flashlight could rest in itself even though it is sh showing on different objects? In other words, does the, the flashlight have to go out and identify with each thing or can it stay at rest in its awareness without grabbing at each thing? If you are sitting and watching and a river is flowing by and there are leaves on the river top and each leaf you go like this. How different than that is than if you kept your awareness right here focused on the river and through your consciousness went leaves. You see the difference? You see where one, your awareness is going and in a way becoming the leaf all the way through and then becoming the next thing that catches you all the way through. In the other one, the awareness is just sitting on the river bank and the leaves are flowing by. This is what I'm talking about, about the mechanics of mind, not the content of mind. I, the leaves are the content. I don't care which content. You can have your own. We all have a lot of nice neurotic content. We should enjoy it. Now, there are two strategies in the mechanics of mind business. They both under the category meditation. And the minute you say the word, all the excess meaning you all have for it comes into play. Oh my God, meditation. Or, oh, thank God, meditation. What does he mean? I don't, I can't meditate. I better sit up, you know, I mean, all those things, you know, I should go to the bathroom quick. <laughs> but the two strategies, there are a, set, a number of strategies in meditation and a number of meanings of the word, but focusing just on freeing the awareness from having to identify with all the phenomena that arise in consciousness all the time. So you can take back your awareness and then you can explore other places and explore itself. One of the strategies to do that is what's called concentration or samadhi practices. And that is, since the mind is going like this, to take one thought and make that your focus. It's like tethering a wild elephant to a post. The post will be this one thought. And the awareness and the instruction, very simply, it doesn't have any religious overtones. The instruction is very simple. It just says, just stay with that thought. Let the awareness rest on that thought. And you try it and you see that within two seconds, it's almost impossible. Because the awareness immediately gets pulled by something else. Like the thought, I'm thinking about a thought. Something else. So what happens if it's the, the way they tame an elephant? I'm not sure they should do it and I'm not sure it's a moral process, but uh, it's an example. <laughs> I shouldn't use immoral examples, and I'm, I'm concerned about this example because I'm feeling for the elephant so much. Because when they take a wild elephant, they put a ring around one of its legs, a metal ring, and then they put a chain, and then they stake the post in the ground. And the elephant tries to go free and tries to do this, 
and it keeps pulling on its leg and pulling on its leg until it quiets down and it stays there and then it's called a tame elephant. Then it lifts logs and people and eats peanuts and stuff like that. Carries people. But if you look at the mind, you could see that it's a little like this. I say to you, I'm going to give you a specific place to focus your mind. And then you'll see that when you try to do it, your mind is going to go like this. In fact, it's going to get more agitated the more I attempt to quiet it, the more you attempt to quiet it. And the agitation will leave your arm bloody as it does with the elephant, but you just keep bringing your awareness back to this primary object. This is known as a samadhi exercise, a concentration exercise. It's fascinating to do. If you don't guilt, get guilty or get aggravated, let me tell you that if you could keep your awareness on your primary object for even 10 seconds, you would already be in some of the highest planes of enlightenment. So relax. Okay. Oh, I can keep my mind on something for 10 seconds, but you'll watch how it flickers through levels of all that immediately. So the impatience that is required is incredible because each time it moves away and you notice it's gone away, just bring it back to the primary object. Bring it back, bring it back, bring it back again. Now we're going to do two forms of this. We're going to do a sitting form and a walking form. And we'll do the sitting form first. So we are now going to do a 20-minute sitting form of meditation in which I will instruct you about this one-pointedness of mind. And every time the mind wanders, bring it back to the primary object. The idea is to, of course, be quiet so you don't have to attend to your body too much, but if, it, if it's in pain, you can move it. Just move it gently and quietly. Let me say as you begin this 20 minutes that this is a practice that I have done now for 22 years. And the most intensive I have done is where I did two months of it, 17 hours a day. All right, you're going to do 20 minutes. So as you're doing the 20 minutes, one of the thoughts you'll probably have is, he's done that 17 hours a day for two months. Yeah. Then you'll understand what a psychotic you're listening to. Um, any discomforts, questions before we begin? Anybody doesn't understand what's going on? Okay, here we go. First, get um, comfortable so that if possible, your head, neck, and spine are in a straight line without making you uncomfortable, though. You can lie down flat or sit up or sit in the chair upright. And then take a few um, slow, intentional breaths in which you uh, release whatever tension. Because now you don't have to think of anything I've said because I'll give you all the instructions you need. You can just relax into this moment.
Now become aware of your breath. The breath is the primary object we are going to use. The reason we choose that is because it's something moving which makes it easier to keep attending to. And it's something very familiar and it's something you always have with you. It's not like a candle flame where you need to find a candle to meditate. So I'm introducing you to your breath as your primary object of meditation. So just attend to your breath at the moment. Hang out with it. It may, when you start to hang out with it, become um, voluntary rather than involuntary. It might start to... be uneven. Don't worry about it. Just watch it just the way it is. You can become aware of the qualities of it. Is it um, moist or is it dry? Is it uh, short or is it long? Is it... um, straight or is it round? Is it uh, hard or is it soft? Be aware not only of the breath, but the places between the in-breath and the out-breath and the out-breath and the in-breath. Now we're going to intensify the practice by narrowing the focus. Instead of focusing on the entire breath, there are two traditional points used from which to watch the breath. One of them is the inside of the tip of the nose where you are like a gatekeeper and each in-breath passes by with the slightest breath or air against the receptors. And each out-breath so passes. And you don't follow, it's like a gatekeeper, you don't follow the being into the building or out into the world, but just stay at the gate. So you'd feel the sensation on your upper lip and on the inside of the tip of your nose. And if you're using this practice, you would maybe silently say to yourself for a while with each in-breath to keep your focus breathing in. And then with the out-breath, you'd say breathing out. But if you're doing that, be careful not to make the words the object, but stay with the breath as the object at the tip of the nose. Now, let's explore just the alternative for a couple of minutes. The alternative is 
that in your abdomen, right below your rib cage, there is a muscle that moves with each breath. And with the in breath, it rises, and with the out breath, it falls. Located so that it's the experience of that particular little muscle rising, falling. And that's what you would say to yourself. With each in breath, you'd say rising, with each out breath, falling. Rising, falling. You can see that that practice keeps the energy more in the middle of the body. The nose one keeps it more um, on the periphery, but that's up to you. You now, for the rest of this session, of these next 15 minutes or so, make a choice to either follow the breath at the tip of the nose or the muscle in the abdomen, either breathing in, breathing out, or rising, falling. Let your awareness rest with the breath at the tip of the nose or in the abdomen as you have chosen. Be aware not only of the movement of the breath, but of the still moments between the in-breath and the out-breath, or the rising and the falling, and the still breath between the falling and the rising, or the out-breath and the next in-breath. Your job in the next 15 minutes, for the benefit of all beings everywhere, out of your compassion, is to keep your awareness on the breath at the tip of your nose or in your abdomen. There's nothing else you have to do now. So every thought or sensation that arises that draws your awareness to it, just notice it lightly and notice that you have left your breath. And instead of feeling guilty about it or upset or argumentative, just go back to the breath. Again and again, just go back to the breath. If you're uncomfortable, note uncomfortableness, then go back to the breath. If the discomfort persists, you can move your body. Notice the way the awareness is caught in moving the body, and then the minute the body is quiet, go back to the breath. If sounds arise, note them the air conditioner. If air on your skin, if you notice it, if you notice anything, become aware that you are noticing it and then return to the breath.
Be with each breath as precisely as you are able to be, either at the tip of the nose or at the abdomen. Be aware of the qualities of the breath, its duration, the changes, as if you were studying the breaths such so intimately, right up with it, as if, or as if you were riding the breath like a horse, like riding a horse or riding a wave. Any model of whether this is hard or easy is just another thought. All the metaphors I suggest are just more thoughts. Let them arise, notice them, go back to the breath. Each time your mind wanders, note it and then once again, gently, lightly, happily return to the breath, as if the breath were a friendly cave you were coming back into that was warm and comfortable. It's like hanging out with the breath. either at the tip of the nose or the muscle in the abdomen. If you find yourself fatigued, take a few deep intentional breaths and then quiet back into your normal rhythm of breathing. But keep your awareness alert, precise, and at the same moment relaxed. I know a woman in Calcutta who in the first 
day of doing this meditation went into the deepest state of concentration. So there's no time frame. It may take you a minute or lifetimes. All you know is that each time the mind wanders, bring it back to the breath. three more minutes of this meditation. In these three minutes, renew your attention to the details of the breath. The breath, don't forget the breath. Today is a little like a smorgasbord, and that was the first dish on the... Questions that that method awakened in you. What would you say at the end? Where is the breathing? Well, obviously, the breathing's in all of those places. The question is, where are you going to focus? You're not issues in, the, in breathing per se, not as a physiological or a health problem or anything. Your only question is where your awareness is. That's the issue whether it'll be on the nose or the abdomen or the hara, or, but we're only working with these two. These are out of traditional Theravadan Buddhism, which is out of the Pali literature. Questions?
there were two question, things that drew his attention because they were so seductive. One was the thought, my breath is stopped. That's always a seductive one because you don't think your breath could stop. I mean, they bury people who have learned how to use the oxygen from their cells and they bury them for a couple of years and then bring them up and they're still around. So you obviously don't have to breathe like we breathe normally. So that was probably a split second of a thought and then it fascinates you and then you stop breathing and the whole thing plays itself out. And the rule of simply under those conditions is stop breathing also, just notice where the breath is and wait. It's a long time between breaths. But the thought, my breath has stopped, is a thought. It's a distraction from the concentration. That's the first one. And the second one is, who's, who's watching this, is another. That is a method in itself. But that isn't the method we're using now. The method we're using now is concentrating on the breath. So the thought, who's watching this, is just at this point an irrelevancy just to be noted, and then you go back to the breath. You, you hear what I'm saying? He said the thought, the breath stops came after the breath stopped. Well, I don't doubt that. But all of that, that whole thought sequence is still just, I mean, no matter how seductive you make it, I'm always going to come back. You must see by now. You can't seduce me into saying, oh, well, then that's really something. So your breath stops. So you won't breathe. Now what? Still stay with the breath. See, the idea is to say, like, I, you take, there are certain teachers I've studied with where you take what's called a vow sitting. And, and he, he's very compassionate. He says, the people that want to take the vow sitting, come sit up front. The rest of you can sit in the back. He said, now, in the next 40 minutes, you take a vow not to move. Not to move anything. Absolutely not to move. Well, it's interesting because you, you, in a kind of a, I'll take that vow, so you take the vow, and the, the vow weighs heavy, believe me. The minute the meditation starts, your knee hurts. And it's just a little knee hurt, and you say, oh, my God, I should have moved it beforehand. See, that's now where your thought is. And then it starts to hurt more and more until it's this piercing, screaming pain. If I don't move it, I'm going to be maimed for life. I mean, that's the next one. But you took a vow not to move. But is the vow more important than the health of my knee? And I mean, and the whole life comes before you around the pain and the whole thing. And it's very interesting. If you really honor the vow, sooner or later, the pain gives up. And there you are. And at the end of the meditation, you get up and there's no pain in your knee. And you realize that the pain at that point, was created by the mind contracting around that thing and creating the pain. And the minute you relaxed and let go. And so you learn that when you say, look, for 20 minutes, how much can happen to me? Even if I don't breathe, don't worry, there's somebody with CPR here or something like that. So let me not cop out. I'm going to go back to my breath each time or wait for it. Wait at the train station for the train that never comes. Yes. Excuse me, you've got to speak as loud as you can. This air conditioning is really hard because it's right in front of me here.
Okay. She got two feelings. One was she went into a space which was very bright. It was a different space that was very bright. That was a noticeable phenomenon. The next and the other one she's talking about is where she didn't feel herself and she felt frightened by that, right? Pull back, pull back. As you start to meditate, you will, two things will happen. One is you will meet incredible phenomena along the way. You'll meet rapture, bliss, colors, lights, beings, everything. And each time you meet any of this stuff, it will so fascinate you that you will stop to smell the pretty sunflowers or the pretty flowers along the path. It's called, it's called stopping to smell the flowers. And you smell them for a while, but you don't just smell them for the rest of your life. You smell them and then you go back to your breath again. You go back always. I went to my teacher at one point and I had been meditating at one point for about 10 days at this other course. And I suddenly went into realms of such peace, such deep cellular peace and so at peace in the universe. I'd never experienced anything like that. It was like something that I'd always must have hungered for because when I felt it, it was so full. And I went to my teacher with such gratitude and I said, oh, thank you so much. I am experiencing the peace I have always wanted. Oh God, it's so good. And he said, that's very good. That's very nice. Now, would you please return to your mat and follow your breath? <laughs> hey, hey. See, can you can see how clinging to an experience, it's a funny form, it's called spiritual materialism. Clinging to the experiences of it, it's so subtle. Now, the other one is that as you, the concentration works a little bit, you'll start to realize that you are losing the control mechanism of being somebody that you thought you were. And you come up against the edge of starting to disappear or dissolve or it's alien to you or you don't feel comfortable. And a lot of people get very frightened at that moment. The art is not to push through, but to say, okay, I'll stay separate and then just stay at the edge of that. Just keep playing with it. Come up to the edge of the fear and taste it. Ooh, frightening. And then you run away. It's like a child going under a water hose. And so, ooh, it's cold. And then they run up and, ooh, it's cold. And then they stay in a little longer until pretty soon. Oh, God. you know. So you just play with it and play with it and play with it. See, the minute you get into an achievement thing, there is time. I've got to go into this space. I've got to concentrate my mind. That whole set of thoughts is a whole drag, and it will make you really rigid and uptight and weird. So are you getting the feeling of it? Is it any? Well, let me tell you that I've just given you a method that if you did that only for the next 20 years, you will be a different person than you are now. <laughs> really, really. Even if you did this 20 minutes a day, that's all it would be required. It is one of the most interesting adventures of your life to explore the relation between your own awareness and all the rest of the stuff that comes into your head. I mean, if you want really excitement, usually when you say, I got a weekend off, well, what will we do? Well, let's see. Let's go. Let's go on the water. Let's take a hike. Let's look at the ball games. Let's read. Let's make love. Let's do something because I'm bored and I've got the time off. I want to do something. Well, the other option is I want really want this weekend. I really want to be something instead of I want to do something. And then as far as doing, empty out a big closet, go into it, make sure there's air. And if you've got a friend, have them leave a little food by the front of the outside of the door and have a toilet available and sit down and try spending a few days there. No television, no telephones, nobody talking to you. Just spend a few days there. I'll tell you, you want adventure? I mean, you will get so bored in about 20 minutes and you'll boredom on my board. Oh God, is this boredom? And then instead of 
see, that's the way it does. That a thought comes in, I'm bored, and it takes you over, and then you're bored. Are you fully bored? Yes, I'm bored. Is there any part of you that isn't bored? No, I'm all bored. Is the part of you telling me you're bored, bored? No. Well, aha, see. You begin to say, who's bored? Who's bored? Like you're, who's bored? And then you just, if your method is your breath, you just go back to your breath. And there are books in the Pali literature, that, like the Tripitaka, the Vasudhi Magga, there are books like this thick that describe any phenomenon that you have during those two days, I'll tell you. And the mind starts to settle on the breath and stay there. It's called neighborhood concentration. See, at first what you'll notice is you try to stay on the breath and the mind will keep going out like that, to this or that, a sense or a thought or a feeling. Then you arrive at the place where the mind stays on the breath and every time something comes up, it goes out and snaps back. That's called neighborhood concentration. That's the beginning of the entry into another, another phase. And there are these articulated phrases. I couldn't believe it when, it first, when I first met, met this literature. I just couldn't believe it. Because all those years of drugs and all that stuff, I've been going and meditation, I've been going in and out of all these planes, which mostly I described as ineffable, indescribable. And here were these texts describing every little component of them. Because it's a very exquisitely articulated science if you figure out how to play it. Now, we're going to do one more practice. That is the same thing. It's a concentration practice. It's a samadhi practice. But we're going to do this as a walking meditation. And I'll tell you just how to do it before you do anything. Just in the same way that you focused on the breath in the abdomen or at the tip of the nose, going in or out or up or down, you are now going to bring your focus and your awareness to your feet and your legs. And you're going to divide each step into three components. One is a lifting, one is a moving, and one is a placing. Now you can get subtler and say now in shifting weight, intention to lift, lifting, intention to move, moving, intention to place, placing. But basically the three components you need are lift, move, place. Lift, move, place. Lift, move, place. Now, the art is to keep the awareness. I mean, most of you walk around, you never think about walking. But and the, and walking is, when you're moving, walking is usually part of it. Unless you, I get, that's not true. You could be driving. But when you're walking, walking is part of it, like breath is. So you bring your awareness to the foot moving, lifting, moving, placing. Lifting, moving, placing. Lifting. Now, when your awareness is focused enough, in the lifting, you will feel the heel lift, you'll feel the muscles, the tendons, you'll feel them all up your leg, you'll feel the whole thing, you'll feel, and in the movement, you'll feel a forward, the change in the weight, and then the coming down, and then the weight as the earth and the foot meet and get more, carrying more of the weight. Then you'll see awareness moving to the other leg and then the intention to lift, moving, placing, duh. Okay. Now, um, this can be done at many rates. You could spend the 20 minute period with one step. That's the slow form. Just this, just this. Okay, that, that's the slow form. Or at the other end, you can just walk quite rapidly, and then you use, you'd probably drop the, you, if you're going like this, 
you'd probably get down to left, right, left, right, left, right. You couldn't even do lift, move, place, lift, move, place, lift, move, place. You'd do left, right. Okay. I suggest, for the most part, a slow walking, lift, move, place, lift, move, place. But find your own rhythm to this. Now, when you get to the end of, you could be, you could do this in a period of about 10 steps and then turn around, or you can walk long ones, depending on what the situation, we can walk out in the halls or outside or anything, do it in a way that is comfortable for you, or you can walk in here, you can do it in a little narrow area or a long area. If you meet an obstacle like another person or a blanket or something, just notice and turning, placing, lift, turn place lift turn place but every time your mind wanders bring it back to your feet moving just tell you one great image we were doing this for about 500 people at a uh, uh, some kind of a outdoor sanctuary or garden and we were at a hall it was a university I guess and uh, we told the people to do this walk and they walked over a hill down the hill on this grassy lawn and down the bottom of the hill was a chapel and a wedding was being performed and the wedding had been performed the people came outside and there were these living dead coming like <laughs> this over the <laughs> and then recently we were doing it in a place where there was only in the building it was raining and we said you can walk up on the third floor but on the third floor it was a college and they were having final exams and one guy came out of the room, he says, I'm going mad. <laughs> so, uh, but it's okay. So here I think we're pretty free. So find a place and you walk for 20 minutes.